Feast of Queen Sylvia, Crown Princess Victoria, and Prince Daniel. missing somebody. The Nobel laureates. Now it's full tur their turn to enter the stage here. To the music of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. James Peebles, Michel Mayor, Didier Kilou, our first to enter here. Followed by chemistry laureate John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham, and Akira Yoshino. Peter Hanke and uh, Olga Tkachuk, the laureates of literature. them yet. Uh, medicine laureates William Kalin, Peter Ratcliffe and Greg Semenza that we see in the picture here. Followed by the literature laureates of uh, 2018 and 2019. Olga Tukarczuk and Peter Economics laureate Abhijit Banerjee and his co-laureate and also wife, Estelle Duflo, and uh, Michael Creamer, also economics laureate. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel laureates, ladies and gentlemen, 
On behalf of the Nobel Foundation, it's a great privilege for me to welcome you all to this year's Nobel Prize Award Ceremony. In particular, I would like to welcome the Nobel laureates and their families to this ceremony. Earlier today, in Oslo, Abiy Ahmed Ali, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to achieve peace and international cooperation, and in particular for his decisive initiative to resolve the border conflict with the neighboring Eritrea. His courageous initiatives show that one individual can make a difference, and even in a relatively short time and a decades-long conflict. Today we are celebrating the Nobel laureates and their outstanding achievements in science, literature, and peace. Their impressive accomplishments are the result of innovative ideas and hard work and serve as inspiration to us all. That is what Alfred Nobel wanted with his prize. Alfred Nobel was himself a scientist and an innovator who had laboratories in all his homes. He was full of ideas and obtained over 30, sorry, 300 patents during his lifetime. He was a strong believer in the importance of research. Only based on facts could the world make real progress. Sadly, Alfred Nobel's optimistic view is today being challenged all over the world. And we see leading politicians who now and then deny facts. Irrational thinking and narrow-minded views are gaining grounds at the expense of scientific achievements, knowledge, and rational thinking. A flagrant example of what we face is the lack of respect for the overwhelming evidence demonstrating that our lifestyle negatively affects the climate. When young people stand up and demand that we all listen to science and act, they deserve our support. As important as defending the application of science on specific issues, such as climate change, is the defense of the scientific method as such. For thousands of years, humanity made advancements, but they were slow. It was not until we started to formulate hypotheses and test them against evidence, often empirical, that progress could make, uh, be made at a faster speed. To quote Carl Sagan, there are many hypotheses that are wrong. That is perfectly all right. They are the aperture of finding out what is right. Science is a self-correcting process. To be accepted, new ideas must survive the most rigorous standards of evidence and scrutiny. This requires academic freedom, resources, and arenas and institutions where to work and meet. This we need to defend. Of course, scientific progress is not without risks. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite and thereby provided self safe explosives. They have been and are used for the benefit to humankind, for instance, in the building of roads and tunnels. However, explosives can also be used in destructive, non-peaceful ways. As we all know, this is true also for the splitting of the atom. Another example is the modern genetic techniques, which offer exciting possibilities, but also pose important ethical concerns. It is an, import, an important duty of scientists to keep the general public well aware of scientific progress, assist in the formulation of appropriate ethical guidelines, and provide legislators with the information they need to install appropriate laws. This should be part of the contract with society. Scientific work requires knowledge, that is obvious. But knowledge is needed more broadly. It is fundamental for our democratic societies. We, have, we all have the right to speak up. All voices count. But it is only through discussion based on knowledge 
that new insights will be gained. Our democracy requires respect for the process, for the arenas where we meet, and for the dialogue. For the survival of our democratic systems, and for the other challenges that we are confronted with, a good education system and schools for all with high quality are essential. Ranging from oxygen levels in cells to planets in new solar systems and ways to alleviate poverty, the discoveries of this year's laureates show an impressive breadth. However, they still clearly center around the core values of the Nobel Prize, rational thinking, humanism, and cooperation across borders. Values that are as relevant as ever before. And they cannot be taken for granted. We all need to engage and contribute. In this, the Nobel Prize can play a role. Only through continued struggle can humankind keep improving itself, its society, and its environment. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel laureates, ladies and gentlemen, once again, very welcome to, the, to today's Nobel Prize Award Ceremony. That was the uh, opening address by Professor Carl Henrik Keldin, the Chairman of the Board of the Nobel Foundation. Before the first prize, some more music.
Montenegro from Sweet Fo Large Orchestra by Swedish composer Helena Muntell, who composed music for well over a hundred years ago. Eders Majestäter, Eders Kungliga Högheter, Your Royal Highnesses, Honored Laureates. This year's Laureates in Physics have taken us along on a journey that began when the universe was very young, less than 400,000 years, and which continues to this day. The young universe can be described entirely according to the laws of physics. The formation of the first atoms marked the first step towards the universe we know today. The temperature was about 3,000 degrees Celsius, and the radiation that so far had been confined in a primordial soup of electrons and protons now began to break free as atoms were formed by a fusion of protons and electrons. Since it was discovered by humans in the mid-1960s, this cosmic radiation had provided the oldest and purest information we have about the early universe. By that time, James Peebles already realized that cosmic background radiation plays a crucial role in how stars and galaxies are formed. His theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology have subsequently laid a foundation for interpreting the measurements of background radiation that are being carried out in satellite-based missions using more and more refined technology. Fluctuations in the background radiation that was frozen out during the transition between the impenetrable primordial soup and a transparent early universe consisting of hydrogen and helium could be given a theoretical interpretation and meaning. Peebles' introduction of cold, dark matter and his reintroduction of Albert Einstein's cosmological constant, also known as dark energy, were the final pieces of the puzzle in the cosmological standard model, which describes the universe at an extraordinarily detailed level. We know that the universe is entirely dominated by dark matter and dark energy, but its physical origins remain shrouded in mystery. The sun, the moon, and the brightly shining planets in our own solar system, as well as the stars that are visible with the naked eye, have been known to human humanity since prehistoric times. But are there planets that orbit stars similar to our own sun? Is our own solar system unique, or are there other planetary systems? Until quite recently, in a historical perspective, these questions remained unanswered. The reason is simple. Planets orbiting other stars cannot be directly observed, since the light they emit is too faint. Instead, we must look for the slightly rocky motion a star makes of a planet, for example, on the size of Jupiter, is rotating around it. Michel Mayor and Didier Quillot built an instrument, a spectrograph, that can measure such movement by utilizing the Doppler effect. Many people are aware of how the Doppler effect influences sound. We hear a high-pitched sound from an emergency vehicle that is approaching us, but a lower-pitched sound as it moves away from us. In October 1995, Mayor and Kilo uh, announced this discovery of a Jupiter-like planet orbiting the star 51 Pegasi in the constellation known as Pegasus, about 50 light years away from Earth. It moves around its star at very high speed. Uh, Pegasi year takes just about four days uh, compared to Earth's one year and Jupiter's 12 years. Other astronomers were quickly able to confirm this discovery, and since then, the new field of ex exoplanets has literally exploded. Today, more than 4,000 exoplanets within a few thousand light years of Earth have been observed, enabling researchers to draw the conclusion that in our own Milky Way galaxy alone, there are perhaps 100 billion planetary systems. Technological development is progressing rapidly, and the question of whether there is life elsewhere in the universe and in our own solar system will engage a new generation of astronomers. Astronomer. Professors Peebles, Major, and Kello, you have been awarded the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics for your outstanding contributions to our understanding of the development of the universe from its early childhood to present days and our Earth's place in the cosmos. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, it is my honor and great pleasure to convey to you our warmest congratulations. I now ask you to step forward to receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. Professor Emeritus James Peebles, born in Winnipeg, Canada, affiliated with Princeton University in the United States, is receiving his physics prize from His Majesty the King of Sweden.
He is here in Stockholm with his wife, Jean Allison, two daughters and several other relatives. And here, Professor Michel Mayor, born in Lausanne, Switzerland, affiliated with the University of Geneva in Switzerland. with his wife, Françoise Mayor. There's three children, grandchildren, and several other relatives. And Didier Kelo, also born in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, affiliated with the University of Geneva, Switzerland, and also University of Cambridge. His party of uh, 14 potential guests that the Nobel laureates can bring with them is his wife, Tina Kelo, their four children, his mother, father, and additional relatives, as well as colleagues and friends.
solo artist Sophie Asplund and this Paprobus Arioso number three by Jean Sibelius, one of Finland's maybe Finland's most well-known composer. And now we will have the Nobel Prize in Chemistry presented by Professor Olof Ramström, member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Imagine a world in which we have unlimited access to stored electric energy wherever we are. Perhaps the electricity is also coming from the renewable energy sources that fluctuate over time, such as wind and sunlight, resulting in an uneven power supply. Not so long ago, this was very much a dream, and repeatedly storing large amounts of electricity for on-demand use was a major challenge. Today, however, we have come a long way to meet this goal, and the lithium-ion battery has increasingly become a viable solution. Ever since Volta's pile, we have known that batteries can store and convert chemical energy into electricity. Still, it has proven to be tremendously arduous to develop efficient and rechargeable batteries. This is certainly true for the power lithium-ion battery, and uh, many groundbreaking discoveries have been required to enable its development. As the name implies, lithium-ion batteries are based on the element lithium in its ionic form. Around 200 years ago, this element was discovered by Arvidsson and Berzelius while analyzing a mineral from the island of Ute in the Stockholm archipelago. They also named the element after the Greek word for stone, even though lithium is our lightest metal. It soon became evident that lithium has several remarkable properties. The atoms are among the smallest we have, and the propensity for releasing an electron makes the element reactive, yet suitable for electrochemistry. Scientists gradually realized that these important properties would be useful for batteries with very high capacity. Our laureates took hold of these challenges and managed to tame lithium into what eventually became the lithium-ion battery. Stanley Whittingham worked for ion transport and superconductivity and discovered a titanium-containing material that could efficiently take up and release lithium ions. This revelation led to a lithium-based battery with a potential of around 2 volts. John Goodenough identified new stable lithium ion ba binding electrode materials based on oxides and phosphates and was able to demonstrate batteries with potentials of over 4 volts. Akira Yoshino developed stable carbon based materials able to host lithium ions and replace reactive lithium metal. In combination with oxide electrodes, he was then able to show lithium-ion cells with high voltage. These discoveries laid the groundwork for the modern lithium-ion battery. The discoveries of our laureates have led to a dramatic change in our society. They have contributed to the so-called mobile revolution, which has resulted in powerful portable electronics. They have enabled the transition we are witnessing in the transport sector which, uh, with increased use of electrically driven vehicles. They have simplified our use of reusable energy sources for the temporary storage of electrical energy and its subsequent on-demand use. This prize also is a clear example of the fact that many crucial technical advances that transform our everyday lives have their origin in chemistry. Only with in-depth knowledge of the properties of metals and metal ions, the electrochemistry and the interactions with different substances and materials could this progress be made. These chemistry discoveries have thus really paved the way for a simplified everyday life and an improvement in our environment. John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham and Akira Yoshino.
you have made groundbreaking discoveries in chemistry that has led to the development of the lithium ion battery. This is a truly great achievement for the benefit of humankind. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations. May I now ask you to step forward and receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. And first to receive the prize is John B. Goodenough, American born in Germany, uh, affiliated with the University of Texas in the United States. He is now at the age of 97, the oldest laureate ever to receive the prize. Now, from the hands of His Majesty the King of Sweden. Mr. Price is awarded with one third each to John Goodenough and also Stanley Whittingham. Next laureate to step forward, born in the United Kingdom, affiliated with Binghamton University, State University of New York. <laughs> Professor Whittingham is here in Stockholm, accompanied by his family, including his wife, Georgina Jude Whittingham, two children, grandchildren colleagues and friends. And Dr. Akira Yoshino from Japan is affiliated with the Meiyo University of Nagoya, Japan. Dr. Yoshino is here in Stockholm with his wife, Kumiko Yoshino, their two daughters and significant others. And now some more music.
from the opera of Romeo and Juliet by French composer Charles Gounod. We heard uh, soprano Sophie Asplund sing in French, Ah, je veux vivre. I want to live in the dream that thrills me this day again. Maybe something that one of, or several of these laureates may be thinking. Royal Highnesses, dear laureates. Så kallades den på 1500-talet den gas vi idag kallar syre. Elixir of life was a name used in the 1500s for the gas we now know as, no, as oxygen. Air of fire was a more concise term chosen by Shirley in the 1700s for the component of air that is needed for burning. We are all on fire. We burn our food within our bodies in order to extract energy. Without oxygen, no energy, no life. We all know that without oxygen we die. What all may not know is that oxygen deficiency constantly rises within our bodies, for example in our muscles while they work. This year's Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine concerns how we sense and adapt in the finest details of our cells when there is lack of oxygen. Already at the end of the 1800s, we learned that at high altitude, with less oxygen, we adapt by producing more red blood cells. In the middle of the 1900s, we realized that this is mediated by erythropoietin from the kidney. How this regulation works has, however, not all, at all uh, been understood. Greg Simons and Sir Peter Radcliffe decided independently to find out how the erythropoietin gene can have such an extraordinary ability to react when oxygen levels drop. Simons had discovered an essential DNA element. Radcliffe was on the same track and they showed that the element is active in all cells. Oxygen sensing thus takes place everywhere in our bodies. Simons had then discovered the critical play that activates a defense gene. It was named HIF. HIF was subjected to an advanced form of control. It is continuously produced, but when oxygen is ample, it disappears. Only when oxygen levels drop, HIF will remain and can mobilize our defense. William Kaelin studied a different problem, von Hippel-Lindau disease, with inherited increased risk of certain types of cancer. Cancer cells without a gene, VHL, had activated genes normally controlled by HIF. So Peter Radcliffe proved in a crucial experiment that VHL, VHL is required for HIF to be removed. But what was the signal to VHL that HIF needs to disappear? In the early 2000s, Cale and Radcliffe both solved this mystery. The signal was formed by attaching oxygen atoms onto HIF. Without oxygen, no signal to VHL, HIF is left intact and can activate our defense. Piece by piece of the puzzle, the laureates explain the sensitive machinery that compensates when the vital oxygen is not available in exactly the right amount. Today, we know that the machinery affects a vast range of functions. When oxygen is lacking, oxygen transport is enhanced by generation of new blood vessels and red blood, vessels, blood, uh, red, uh, red blood cells. Our cells are also instructed to economize with the oxygen available by reprogramming their energy metabolism. Oxygen sensing is also involved in many diseases. As a result of the laureate's discoveries, intense activities are underway to develop treatments against, for example, anemia and cancer. Professors Semenza, Radcliffe and Kaylin, your groundbreaking discoveries have shed light on a beautiful mechanism, explaining how we sense and adapt to fluctuating oxygen levels. The system you have clarified is of fundamental importance for all aspects of physiology and for many human diseases. Without it, animal, li animal life would not be possible on this planet. On behalf of the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institutet, it is my great privilege to convey to you our warmest congratulations. I now ask you to step forward to receive your Nobel Prize from the hands of His Majesty the King. Professor William Kalin, born in New York, uh, 
United States is affiliated with Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Harvard Medical School in Boston, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Chevy Chase. Here in Stockholm, accompanied by his family, including two children, his partner Karen Cantor, and other relatives. So, Peter Ratcliffe was uh, born in Lancashire, United Kingdom, and is affiliated with the Francis Crick Institute of London in the UK and also the, the uh, Target Discovery Institute of Oxford, the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research in Oxford. And in the audience, he's bowing, amongst others, to his family, including his wife, Fiona Ratcliffe, and uh, four children. American, Professor Greg Semenza, also born in New York, is at the John Hopkins University of Baltimore. He's here in Stockholm with his family, including wife, Laura Margaret, Kash Semenza, and uh, three children. And that was a presentation speech by Anna Vedel that we heard earlier. Majesty's Royalties Laureates. Now it's time for the prize in literature. Polish literature ch shines on Europe. Several Nobel Prizes and now a bard of global stature and rare breath, poetic and humorous. Poland, Europe's crossroads, perhaps its heart. Its history exposes to Olga Tokarczuk, a victim ravaged by great powers but with its own history of colonialism and anti-Semitism. She does not retreat from unpalatable truth, even under threat of death. Her fusion of intensive embodiment and ephemeral unreality, intimate observation and mythological obsession make her one of our time's most original prose writers with new ways of viewing reality. She is a virtuoso of instant portraiture, capturing characters in the act of escaping daily life. She writes of what no one else does, the world's excruciating strangeness. Flights is a wonderfully varied description of passage through transit halls and hotels. Meetings with uh, figures we know so little of. And a shower of items from dictionaries, fairy tales, and documents. She circles the poles of nature, culture, reason, madness. Hon cirklar kring polerna natur, kultur, förnuft, vansinne, manlig and scoots like a sprinter across socially and culturally fabricated borders. Her prose, drastic, rich in ideas, is a nomadic movement throughout her 15 or so books. Her villages are centers of the universe. The place, a uh, protagonist, its singular destinies woven into a fresco of fable and myth. We live and die in the stories of others, where Katyn, for example, is at once a forest, at once a massacre. 
My writing is a translation of images to words. From these images arise apocalyptic histories and mundane episodes and form her magnum opus, the books of Jacob, into a picaresque novel and a vibrant panorama of the period around 1752. It's history of ideas and religious history. It is the compulsions of the time and metaphysics, superstition and madness. It's salons and prayer meetings and people so alive and up closet that Tukarczyk might just have met them on the street. She lavishes on interiors of country manors, monasteries and Jewish homes, with dresses, gardening, menus. Not least, she turns anonymous women into individuals, giving a voice to many others disappeared without trace. <coughs> It is author Pavest Bay of the Swedish Academy speaking. The sect leader, Jakob Frank, is a charismatic mystic manipulator and swindler, a rebel provoking god. He questions current order, especially the submission of women. With his adherents, the Frankists, he wants to bring about a new world. This was also the Nazis' rationale for obliterating Poland. Utopias are siren calls replacing our historical memory. But we never meet the Messiah, only forges and frauds. Glimpses in subtext are Tukarczyk's Jewish heritage and her hope for a Europe without borders for knowledge. In 18th century Poland, she sees parallels with the later eras Nazism and Stalinism, even with current right-wing populists who, in her words, speak of a country's past like in a boy's book about heroes and traitors. But, she says, there is no history, only people's lives. The book, Books of Jacob, is an extraordinary tale. The great questions of evil, God, and the future are stitched together in a prosaic portrayal in which Tokarczuk, using her sensual imagination, ponders a coffee grinder and makes of it a time grinder, Real, reality's own axis. Generations to come will return to Olga Tokarczuk's thousand-paged miracle to discover a richness we barely discern today. I see Alfred Nobel nodding in friendly approval from his heaven. Pani Tokarczuk, Akademia Svedska, gratulerar vam. Proche Odrebanji, Literatske Nagrodi Noblas, från Diego Kralewski Modski. In Polish, we heard Ms. Mrs. Tokarczuk, the Swedish Academy congratulates you. Please receive your Nobel Prize from the hand of His Majesty the King. And this is the Literature Prize of 2018. Since last year, there were no Literature Prizes being awarded at all. So we're catching up now with Olga Tokarczuk. I'm walking back to 2019 Prize of Literature. We will hear the presentation speech by Professor Anders Olsson, 2019's laureate Peter Handke. After some music.
was the uh, Drottning Home music by Swedish composer Johan Helmich Roman, called often the father of Swedish music. And now, Majestäter, Professor Anders Olsson from the Swedish Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, contemporary literature is blooming like never before on alien shores. Such a place is no man's bay. Peter Hanke's name for the place southwest of Paris that has been his residence for 30 years. Peter Hanke, born in Kenton in Austria, has worked abroad for almost his entire writing career. He has freely chosen exile as a productive path from where he depicts not metropolises, but the peripheries. In the sweeping story of My Year in the No Man's Bay, the narrator describes in scrupulous detail the backwater where he lives. Just as prominent as the noise from a neighbor's lawnmower or madcap arias is the beguiling buzz of wild bees in the rocks or the bristly whiskers of the beaver rats in the nameless pond. Is pond the right word? Ask Flaubert. Periphery has become center. Peter Hanke's, Peter Hanke's work is suffu suffused with a strong spirit of discovery, a desire to write the world fresh. In his debut year, 1966, he attacked the literary world for its shortcomings in describing reality. But over 50 years later, with about 80 works behind him, including films and about a score of plays, it is evident not only that he has realized his dream of a new prose, but also how his writing has become influential for several generations of writers in post-war Europe. In his extraordinary repetition, Hanke allows his narrator to revisit his childhood environs in eastern Slovenia. He checks into an inn where he makes friends with a waiter. Coming back late one night, he sees from his window the waiter carrying a stack of dishes to a stream close by. With graceful movements, he launches them one by one onto the water, letting them sail away. The scene, as mysterious as it is unforgettable, it is described dispassionately and without comment. It seems that there, that here, a dream is born of another existence. Hanke's writing is often about returning to origins to remember the dead, but no strict iteration is possible. In a sorrow beyond dreams, a life story, the stark portrayal of his mother after her suicide in 1971, he lets us experience the extent of the catastrophe through his elucidating gaze and restrained language. But Hanke's groundbreaking artistry with language emerges when his hyperactive sense for the particular compels investigation of his own medium. In his books, we are often on foot, and his epic steps appear with full effect in his story, Slow Homecoming, 1979. The main story is of death. But the telling lives, guided by his grounded feet and a gaze gifted with language vision. He has written, to be receptive is everything. Peter Hanke has said that the classics not only saved him, but also preserved him. But he is also a deeply contemporary writer who must confront the paternal heritage perverted by the Nazis' occupation of Austria in the war. He represents a Slovenian maternal lineage which motivates his anti-nationalistic myth of his origins. Periphery becomes center again in Hanke's latest major work, The Fruit Thief, a trek from No Man's Bay to the heart of Picardy. Picardy. 
ortnamnen glöder och varje place names glow and every step uncovers new fissures in reality as so often hanker rejects contemporary conformity and allows a hunt through brush for a lost cat to become a main theme skogen efter en borttappad katt spela en huvudroll och när han ställer oss inför mötet med and when he shows us the miracle of meetings he finds it with a stateless with a young pizza delivery man on his scooter and with the mythically shimmering fruit thief herself alexia Lieber Peter Hanke, ich möchte die wärmsten Glückwünsche. Dear Peter Hanke, I would like to convey the warmest congratulations on the Swedish Academy as I call on you to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature for 2019 from the hands of His Majesty the King. Peter Hanke, born in 1942 in Griffin, Austria, and lives now in Chaville in France. He is in Stockholm with his family, including his wife, Sophie Semin Hanke, three children, his publisher and friends. And before presentation of the Swedish Riksbank's Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel, we will hear some more music, this time by Edvard Elga. Salut d'amour. And now it's time for Professor Jakob Svensson to give us a presentation speech for the Economics Prize. Majesties, Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel laureates, ladies and gentlemen. Eight minus five is three. 
This is a simple exercise for most 90-year-olds, nine-year-olds, but fewer than half the fourth grade students in Mozambique and Nigeria can solve it. In rural India, only half the children in grade five can read a short text intended for second graders. These are not exceptions. Worldwide, hundreds of millions of children leave school without basic skills. As adults, they cannot calculate the correct change from a transaction or read and understand instructions. Nor can they help their children with homework, let alone build a career. Over the last two decades, living standards have noticeably improved almost everywhere on the planet. Despite these improvements, huge challenges remain. Why aren't children learning how to read and count in school? Why are so many children dying of diseases that could be treated or prevented at a low cost? Why do small holders not adopt simple technologies, such as artificial fertilizer, even though they can provide large returns? It was to answer these questions, and similar ones, that this year's laureates began the pioneering research into the mechanisms behind poverty and into effective measures to alleviate it. Their work laid the foundation for a new approach, which in just 20 years has transformed research on global poverty. The new approach is experimental, so just as in much medical and natural science research, causation is established through randomized control studies. However, these are not experiments in a laboratory but studies of people in their everyday environments. The approach also has a clear connection to economic theory. Somewhat simplified, we can say that theory can provide guidance on important mechanisms behind poverty. Field experiments can investigate the quantitative importance of these mechanisms in practice. The research based on the new experimental approach has provided us with a deeper understanding of the root causes of poverty. To return to the example of the learning crisis, we now know that the most important reasons why in many countries children learn so little in school are not large class sizes or the lack of textbooks. Instead, the problems are what teachers do in the classroom, what they know, and surprisingly often, whether they show up at all. I believe that searching for explanations for poverty and the means to eradicate it is for econo economists like trying to solve the mystery of cancer for medical researchers. This year's laureates have taken research on poverty further than anybody before, and millions of people are now benefiting from effective measures that were developed and tested using the new experimental approach for which they laid foundation. Dear Professors Banerjee, Duflo and Kramer, you have introduced a way of conducting research that helps us better to understand the root causes of poverty, as well as to find effective ways of alleviating it. The experimental approach you pioneered has transformed research in development economics. The research that follows this approach has already influenced policy, and it keeps improving our ability to help those in most need. It's an honor and a privilege to convey to you, on behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, our warmest congratulations. May I now ask you to receive your prizes from His Majesty the King. Professor Abhijit Banerjee was born in Mumbai in India and lives in Boston where he works as a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States. And he is the 
husband of the uh, one of the other economics laureates. We see here Esther Duflo, born in 1972 in Paris, France, also works at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, actually just two doors away from Abhijit Banerjee at the Economics Department. And they are here with the two children as well as colleagues and friends. And one of the friends and dear colleagues is the third laureate this year, Professor Michael Kramer, born in New York in 1964. He's at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, not far from his colleagues and friends, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee at MIT. And he's here in Stockholm uh, with his family, including his wife, Dr. Rachel Glenister, that we see here. They're two sons. And uh, Rachel has also uh, worked at uh, the research network JPAL that was created by these scientists. And now the prize ceremony is uh, coming to its end with uh, the Swedish national anthem. Prime Minister Stefan Löfven to the right and Fredrik Schell, Marshal of the Realms of the Royal Court there to the right and here members of the Swedish Academy. Princess Sophia, Prince Carl Philip, party leader Ulf Christensen, Princess Madeleine to the left here, Queen Sylvia, Crown Princess Victoria to the right, and King Carl Gustav behind them, Prince Daniel. Swedish politicians and the uh, respective members of government, Swedish business society, and of course, a lot of prominent scientists here this afternoon. Laureate Stephen Shu there in the on the podium. And now we will be listening to the Queen of Sheba's festivity march from the Prognitals sung by Swedish composer Hugo Alvian, played while the guests are leaving the auditorium here in the Stockholm Concert Hall, concluding 2019 Nobel Prize ceremony. Thank you for joining us. 